The following is a speech delivered by Frederick Douglass on July the 5th, 1852. Mr. President, friends and fellow citizens, he who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. The feeling has crept over me, quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. The task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. I know that apologies of this sort are generally considered flat and unmeaning. I trust, however, that mine will not be so considered. Should I seem at ease, my appearance would much misrepresent me. The little experience I have had in addressing public meetings in country schoolhouses avails me nothing on this present occasion. The papers and the placards say that I am to deliver a Fourth of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way. For it is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall and to address many who now honor me with their presence. But neither their familiar faces nor the perfect gauge I think I have of Corinthian Hall seems to free me from embarrassment. The fact is, Ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable, and the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. The fact that I am here today, to me, is a matter of astonishment, as well as of gratitude. You will not therefore be surprised if in what I have to say I invince no elaborate preparation nor grace my speech with any high-sounding exordium with little experience and less learning, I have been able to throw my thoughts hastily and imperfectly together, entrusting to your patient and generous indulgence. I will proceed to lay them before you. This for the purpose of this celebration is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This to you is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance and to the signs and to the wonders associated with that act and that day. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you 
that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I am glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. Seventy-six years, though a good old age for a man, is but a mere speck in the life of a nation. Three score years and ten is the allotted time for individual men, but nations number their years by the thousands. According to this fact, you are, even now, only in the beginning of your national career, still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad that this is so. There is hope in the thought, and hope is much needed under the dark clouds which lower above the horizon. The eye of the reformer is met with angry flashes portending disastrous times. But his heart may well beat lighter at the thought that America is young and that she is still in the impressible stage of her existence. May he not hope that high lessons of wisdom, of justice, and of truth will yet give direction to her destiny. Were the nation older, the patriot's heart might be sadder and the reformer's brow heavier. Its future might be shrouded in gloom, and the hope of its prophets go out in sorrow. There is consolation in the thought that America is young. Great streams are not easily turned from channels worn deep in the course of ages. They may sometimes rise in quiet and stately majesty and inundate the land, refreshing and fertilizing the earth with their mysterious properties. They may also rise in wrath and fury and bear away on their angry waves the accumulated wealth of years of toil and hardship. They, however, gradually flow back to the same old channel and flow on as serenely as ever. But while the river may not be turned aside, it may dry up and leave nothing behind but the withered branch and the unsightly rock to howl in the abyss sweeping wind the sad tale of departed glory. As with rivers, so with nations. Fellow citizens, I shall not presume to dwell at length on the associations that cluster about this day. The simple story of it is that, 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. The style and title of your sovereign people on which you now glory was not then born. You were under the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government as the home government 
and England as the fatherland. This home government, you know, although a considerable distance from your home, did, in the exercise of its parental prerogatives, impose upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, and limitations as in its mature judgment it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers, who had not adopted the fashionable idea of this day, of the infallibility of government and the absolute character of its acts, presumed to differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and the justice of some of those burdens and restraints. They went so far in their excitement as to pronounce the measures of government unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive, and altogether such as ought not to be quietly submitted to. I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of these measures fully accords with that of your fathers. Such a declaration of agreement on my part would not be worth much to anybody. It would certainly prove nothing as to what part I might have taken had I lived during the great controversy of 1776. To say now that America was right and England wrong is exceedingly easy. Everybody can say it. The dastard, not less than the noble brave, can flippantly discant on the tyranny of England towards the American colonies. It is fashionable to do so. But there was a time when to pronounce against England in favor of the cause of the colonies tried men's souls. Those who did so were accounted in their day mischief makers, plotters of mischief, agitators and rebels, dangerous men. To side with the right against the wrong and with the weak against the strong and with the oppressed against the oppressor, here lies the merit and the one which of all others seems unfashionable in our day. The cause of liberty may be stabbed by the men who glory in the deeds of your fathers. But to proceed, feeling themselves harshly and unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and remonstrated. They did so in a decorous and respectful and loyal manner. Their conduct was wholly unexceptionable. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn. Yet they persevered. They were not men to look back. As the sheet anchor takes a firmer hold when the ship is tossed by the storm, so did the cause of your fathers grow stronger as it breasted the chilly blast of kingly displeasure. The greatest and best of British statesmen admitted its justice, and the loftiest eloquence of the British Senate came to its support. But with that blindness which seems to be the unvarying characteristic of tyrants since Pharaoh, 
and his hosts were drowned in the Red Sea, the British government persisted in the exactions complained of. The madness of this course, we believe even now, is admitted by England. But we fear the lesson is wholly lost on our present leader. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers were wise men, and if the day did not go mad, they became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of a total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It was a startling idea at the time, much more so than we at this distance of time regarded. The timid and the prudent, as had been intimidated of that day, were of course shocked and alarmed by it. Such people lived then, had lived before, and will probably ever have a place on this planet. And their course in respect to any great change, no matter how great the good to be attained or the wrong to be redressed by it, may be calculated with as much precision as can be the course of the stars. They hate all changes. But silver and gold and copper change, of this sort of change, they are always strongly in favor. These people were called Tories in the days of your fathers, and the appellation probably conveyed the same idea that is meant by a more modern, though a somewhat less euphonious term, which we often find in our papers applied to some of our old politicians. The opposition to the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful, but, but amid all their terror and affrighted vociferations against it, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on and the country moved with it. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshippers of property, clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of a national sanction. They did so in the form of a resolution and as we seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day, whose transparency is at all equal to this, it may refresh your minds and help my story if I read it. Resolved that these united colonies are, end of right, ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded. And today you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you therefore may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history. The very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Fellow citizens, 
I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men, too, great enough to give fame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to rise at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable, and yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. They love their country better than their own private interests. And though this is not the highest form of human excellence, all will concede that it is a rare virtue and that when it is exhibited, it ought to command respect. He who will intelligently lay down his life for his country is a man whom it is not in human nature to despise. Your fathers staked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor on the cause of their country. In their admiration of liberty, they lost sight of all other interests. They were peacemen, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. They showed forbearance but they knew its limits. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. You may well cherish the memory of such men. They were great in their day and generation. Their solid manhood stands out the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. Fellow citizens and friends, I need not enter further into the causes which led to this anniversary. Many of you understand them better than I do. You could instruct me in regard to them. That is a branch of knowledge in which you feel perhaps a much deeper interest than your speaker. The causes which led to the separation of the colonies from the British crown have never lacked for a tongue. They have all been taught in your common schools, narrated at your firesides, unfolded from your pulpits, and thundered from your legislative halls, and are as familiar to you as household words. They form the staple of your national poetry and elegance. My business, if I have any here today, is with the present. 
the accepted time with God and his cause as the ever-living now. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would to God both for your sakes and ours that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to those questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Who so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Who so stolen and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee? when the chains of servitude have been torn from his limbs. I am not that man. In a case like that, the dumb might eloquently speak and the lame man leap as a heart, but such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich Inheritance of justice, liberty, and prosperity, and independence, bequeathed by your fathers, is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems where inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean citizens to mock me by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct. And let me warn you that it is dangerous to copy the example of a nation whose crimes lowering up to heaven were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, bearing that nation in irrecoverable ruin. I can today take up the plaintive lament of appeal and a woe-smitten people by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. 
for there they carried us away captive, required of us a song, and they who wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains heavy and grievous Yesterday are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do not forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, May my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the root of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing there identified with the American bondsman making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of this nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God, and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion. I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call and question and to denounce with all the emphasis I can everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command. And yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not a, at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. But I fancy I hear some one of my audience say, it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? 
your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. Which point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do the people of this country need light? Must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? That point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties the teaching of the slave to read or to write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beast of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets and the fowls of the air, when the cattle of your hills and the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then will I argue with you that the slave is a man. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping all, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading and writing and ciphering, acting as clerks and merchants and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprise common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planting, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God, and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? That he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation? as a matter beset with great difficulty involving a doubtful application of the principles of justice, hard to be understood? How shall I look today in the presence of Americans, dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have a natural right to freedom? 
speaking of it relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively, to do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What am I to argue? That it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relationships to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to lay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with arms, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employments for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. Fellow citizens, but still more inhuman, disgraceful, and scandalous state of things remains to be presented. By an act of the American Congress, not yet two years old, Slavery has been nationalized in its most horrible and revolting form. By that act, Mason and Dixon's line has been obliterated. New York has become as Virginia, and the power to hold and hunt and sell men, women, and children as slaves remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is so coextensive with the Star Spangled Banner and American Christianity. Where those go may also go the merciless slave hunter. Where these men are, man is not sacred. He is a bird for the sportsman's gun. By that most foul and fiendish of all human decrees, the liberty and person of every man are put in peril. Your broad Republican domain is hunting ground for men, not for thieves and robbers, enemies of society, merely but for men guilty of no crime. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. Your president your Secretary of State, our lords and nobles and ecclesiastics enforced as a duty you owe to your free and glorious country and to your God that you do this accursed thing. Not fewer than 40 Americans have within the past two years been hunted down and without a moment's warning hurried away in chains, consigned to slavery, excruciating torture. Some of those had wives and children depending on them for bread. But of this no account was made. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to the right of marriage. And to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included, for black men 
There are neither law, justice, humanity, not religion. The fugitive slave law makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judge who tries them. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery and five when he fails to do so. The oath of any of the two villains is sufficient under the hell black enactment to send the poor, pious, and exemplary black man into the remorseless jaws of slavery. His testimony is nothing. He can bring no witness for himself. The minister of American justice is bound by the law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let this damning fact be perpetually told. Let it be thundered around the world that in tyrant killing king hating people loving democratic christian america the seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and palatable bribe and are bound in deciding in the case of a man's liberty hear only his accusers in glaring violation of justice and shameless disregard of the forms of administrating law in cunning arrangement to entrap the defenseless and in diabolical intent, this fugitive slave law stands alone in the annals of tyrannical legislation. I doubt if there be another nation on the globe having the brass and the baseness to put such a law on the statute books. If any man in this assembly thinks differently from me in this matter and feels able to disprove my statements, I will gladly confront him at any suitable time and place he may select. I take this law to be one of the grossest infringements of Christian liberty. And if the churches and ministers of our country were not stupidly blind or most wickedly indifferent, that they too would so regard it. At the very moment that they are thanking God for the enjoyment of civil and religious liberty, and for the right to worship God according to the dictates of their own consciousness, they are utterly silent in respect to a law which robs religion of its chief significance and makes it utterly worthless to a world lying in wickedness. Did this law concern the mint, the anise, the common? abridge the right to sing psalms or to partake of the sacrament or to engage in any of the ceremonies of religion, he would be smitten by the thunder of a thousand pulpits. A general shout would go up from the church demanding repeal, repeal, instant repeal. And it would go hand, and it would go hard, with that politician who presumed to solicit the votes of the people without inscribing this motto on his banner. Further, if this demand were not complied with another, Scotland would be added to the history of religious liberty, and the stern old covenanters would be thrown into the shade. A John Knox would be seen at every church door and heard from every pulpit, and Fillmore would have no more quarter than was shown by Knox. To the beautiful but treacherous Queen Mary of Scotland, the fact that the church of our country, with fractional exceptions, 
does not esteem the, fugi the fugitive slave law as a declaration of war against religious liberty implies that the church regards religion simply as a form of worship, an empty ceremony, and not a vital principle requiring active benevolence, justice, love, and goodwill towards man. It esteems sacrifice above mercy, psalm singing above right doing, solemn meetings above practical righteousness, a worship that can be conducted by persons who refuse to give shelter to the houseless, to give bread to the hungry, clothing to the naked, and who enjoy obedience to a law forbidding these acts of mercy is a curse, not a blessing to mankind. The Bible addresses all such persons as scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites who pay tithes of mint and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. But the church of this country is not only indifferent to the wrongs of the slave, it actually takes sides with the oppressors. It has made itself the bulwark of American slavery and the shield of slave hunters. Many of its most eloquent divines who stand as the very lights of the church have shamelessly given the sanction of religion and the Bible to the whole slave system. They have taught that man may be properly sold as a slave, that the relation of master and slave is ordained by God that to send back an escape bondman to his master is clearly the duty of all the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this horrible blasphemy is palmed off upon the world for Christianity. <laughs>